how would I build my time machine? I mentioned in the last video that I love theoretical science, and hands down my favorite topic to research was time travel. And today, I'm going to make a very old dream of mine come true and design my very own time machine. Now a good first step in designing a time machine is to select the method for time travel, because there are actually a lot of different methods for time travel, and each method has its own pros and cons. And because there are so many different theoretical methods to time travel, it would help to make a list of what we want our time machine to do. This way, when we're looking at the different ways to time travel, we'll know exactly what we're looking for. In this case, I want to build a time machine that's practical for traveling forwards in time. And by that I mean I want to be able to easily travel hundreds of years into the future. The time machine can't be too large, so I'll be excluding any time travel methods that involves building a device that's infinitely long, infinitely big, or anything else a physicist is using to overcompensate. Traveling backwards in time is optional, but I will give huge bonus points if the time travel method is able to accomplish this. And most importantly, my time machine needs to be able to travel through time with me. I don't want to time travel and then end up stuck somewhere. Just in case the future doesn't turn out that great. And now that we know what we want, let's get started. Our first stop in our time travel window shopping is to simply move fast. This was actually the topic of the last video, so I won't go into too much detail here, but the basic idea is that the faster you move, the more you travel into the future. This effect is called time dilation. It's a very simple sounding way to time travel. The problem is, is that it's not a very efficient way to time travel. This is Sergei Krikalev, a Russian astronaut and today's most famous time traveler. Krikalev spent a total of 803 days, 9 hours, and 39 minutes in space orbiting around the Earth at high speed. In doing so, Krikalev holds the record for being the human to experience the most time dilation, traveling about 0.02268 seconds into the future, over 2 years in space for 2 hundredths of a second. At that rate, it would take about 100 years of orbiting around the world in space to travel about 1 second into the future. So I guess we did it. We already invented the time machine, and it's the International Space Station. It's not a very fast time machine, but it still works. So now that we have this, let's upgrade our time machine. If we were in a spaceship moving at half the speed of light, 149,896,229 meters per second, then how much would we travel into the future? According to Einstein's time dilation equation, when the velocity is half the speed of light, for every one second you are traveling, you are only traveling about 0.1547 seconds into the future. That's a little better. You could beat Krikalev's time travel record in less than a second. But it's still not that great, especially after putting in all the effort to travel half the speed of light. If we wanted to travel one year into the future like this, we would have to be constantly moving at half the speed of light for over six and a half years. Honestly, you're better off staying home. And traveling backwards in time isn't that great with this method either. Again, I talked about this a lot more in the last video. But long story short, in order to go backwards in time, you would need to be moving faster than light. Which is impossible. But if hypothetically, we were to move at double the speed of light for one second, the universe would push us backwards in time one second to stop us from traveling faster than light. So after breaking the laws of physics to the extreme, if we were somehow able to travel at double the speed of light for one year, we would only go back in time one year from when we started. No thank you, this method is out, I need a better way of time traveling. Something that can easily take us thousands of years into the future if we want. Okay, don't hate me for this next one. Suspended animation. I know this isn't technically traveling through time, and it's not what people think of when they think of a time machine, but I still think it's worth at least mentioning. Suspended animation is, theoretically, being able to turn off the entire human body and preserve it in a way that it can be turned on safely at any time in the future. So here, instead of warping time to go to the future, we're instead making it possible to wait long enough until it is the future. Suspended animation is the broad term to describe any theoretical way to preserve someone's body in a way that they can be reanimated later. Then cryogenic sleep is more specifically freezing the body to be unfrozen later. This is currently the most popular way of attempting suspended animation, and there are already people trying this, and it is very controversial because, well, we have no idea how to safely unfreeze these people. We would need to be able to reverse the damage from lack of oxygen, fix any fractures caused by the process of freezing, brain damage, because that's the only way you'd want to do something like this. The body is also probably poisoned in some way from the cryoprotectants, or the chemicals used to stop damaging ice crystals from forming, basically antifreeze. And we would have to replace any cells that didn't successfully get preserved. On top of all that, if the frozen person underwent cryogenic sleep because they were dying of something like cancer, we'd also need to have a cure for their cause of death in order to safely revive them. That's a lot to do to revive one person, and we don't know how to do any of those things. So yeah, we either have cryogenic sleep centers full of potential time travelers, or some really fancy graveyards. I'm more inclined to think the latter. But to give this a fair chance, let's say suspended animation is possible and 100% safe, whether it's by freezing the body or some other method. 
I still don't want to use this method to time travel for a number of reasons. You are completely dependent on another person or a computer to reanimate you. And if you're suspended for thousands of years, you have to trust that people generations from now care enough to keep you alive. I don't want to feel that vulnerable. Then there's robberies, fires, power outages, natural disasters, a lot can go wrong when your body's just helplessly laying around. On top of that, there is a 0% chance of traveling backwards in time. You sleep, you wake up, that's it. And don't tell me you could just go far enough into the future to when a time machine that can go backwards in time is invented. That is cheating. The only good thing that came out of researching this one is that I learned what the word quackery meant. Moving on, gravity is another potential tool we could use for time travel. Gravity warps space-time. And to simply put it, the more gravity you experience, the more you travel into the future. One of the easiest ways we could accomplish this method of traveling into the future is to take a spaceship, orbit around a black hole, but not too close, and we'd be traveling into the future because of the increased gravitational pull. Unfortunately, the closest black hole to Earth that we know of is V616 Monocerotis, also known as V616mon. Saying it out loud, it sounds like a Digimon name. Anyways, V616mon is approximately 3,000 light years away from Earth. So if we could travel at the speed of light, it would still take us about 3,000 years just to get there. And if we could travel faster than light, well, we wouldn't need to go there for time travel now, would we? Okay, getting theoretical here. Maybe instead of going to a black hole for gravity, we could try to develop a device that emits a gravitational field to travel into the future. Even if this were possible, the problem here is that gravity spreads out. So by traveling into the future with a gravity machine, everything closest to you is going to travel into the future with you, and the effects will gradually weaken further away. What's the point of time travel if everything around you is going to time travel with you? Okay, we've already pretty much crossed the line from theoretical science to impossible science, so we might as well go all the way. Maybe we could have a gravity-making machine that only produces a strong gravitational field in a small area so that the gravitational field doesn't spread out. I don't know how this would be possible, it's just an idea. I want my time machine. But then, you and the time machine don't disappear. You and the time machine would still just be sitting there out in the open. You just look frozen to the world as you travel into the future. Oh no, this just turned into another kind of suspended animation, didn't it? So then we have to face the same problems as we did then. If you're traveling a thousand years into the future, you need to make sure that nothing bad happens to you in that time. Because if a meteor is heading straight towards you, the meteor might freeze with you, but it's going to hit you the second you stop time traveling. And originally, I was going to talk about using anti-gravity to travel backwards in time. It was going to be cool. I was going to talk about how anti-gravity has zero mass, so it wouldn't cause us to explode like anti-matter would. But there is another huge problem with this. Man, I don't like this method of time travel anymore. There's just so many problems. Even if this method were possible, when you try to travel backwards in time, you don't disappear. You would end up colliding with your past self because you're both occupying the same space at the same moment. You get into a car accident with your past self and kinda create a paradox by killing yourself before you can travel backwards in time to kill yourself. This is a serious problem. It's not enough to just travel backwards in time. To safely time travel into the past, we would need to jump over time so we don't collide with our past selves. Which brings us to wormholes. In 1935, Einstein and his colleague Nathan Rosen thought of a scenario where the space-time tear caused by a black hole connected with the space-time tear of another black hole, connecting the two different points in space-time. This example became known as the Einstein-Rosen bridge. Now take this example, remove the black holes in the way so that we can travel through, and this is what we know today as a wormhole. The advantage to using a wormhole for my time machine is that a wormhole can theoretically traverse across time and space. So not only could I travel to any time instantaneously, past or future, I could also travel to any place I wanted, even if it's millions of light years away. But here's the disclaimer. While Einstein's theory of general relativity says that there could be wormholes, it doesn't say that there are wormholes. It's all theoretical. It's possible that they could exist, and there's no proof that they don't exist, but there's also no proof that they do exist. So using wormholes might not even be a possibility. But just for the sake of keeping my dream of having my own time machine alive, let's say that wormholes are a possibility. Then how would I make a time machine using wormholes? My time machine would probably have to start by creating a quantum-sized tear in space-time. Something simple. Then the time machine would need to expand the tear so that it's large enough to travel through. The wormhole is going to constantly be trying to collapse, so the time machine will need to be constantly putting in a lot of energy just to keep the wormhole open. The larger the wormhole is, the stronger the collapsing force is going to be, so a larger wormhole is going to take exponentially more energy to keep open than a smaller one. So the wormhole is probably going to be a minimum size, something small enough to just crawl through. And now this is our space-time tear. But looking back to the Einstein-Rosen bridge model, to create the bridge, we need to connect this tear to another space-time tear. The most likely way to do this is by connecting the space-time tear caused by this time machine to another tear caused by another time machine. 
In this example, we've pretty much made a time machine elevator. We can only travel from one time machine to another time machine. So we can only travel to times and places where there's already a time machine to connect the bridge. Because of this, it would be impossible to travel to any time before the invention of the first time machine. So if I were to invent this kind of time machine, I would more than likely get a lot of tourists from the future jumping out as soon as I turn on the time machine. After all, this would be the invention of the time machine, the furthest moment back in time a person could travel to. It's historical, it's important, and there'd probably be a crowd. Then I would say something like, what are you people doing in my time machine? And yes, that is the first place my mind went to with this scenario. No, my time machine can't travel in time with me because it needs to be keeping the wormhole open, and I know I said that that was the most important point of a time machine, but if there's always going to be a time machine on the other side, then that's just as good. And there might be a way of modifying this time machine to go to a time or place that doesn't already have a time machine. All you have to do is create a space-time tear, target it to where and when you want to go, like the Precambrian era for example. Then you expand the space-time tear so that one side of the wormhole is large enough to go through. But you still can't travel through the other side just yet. The other end of the wormhole would be quantum-sized, making the whole thing impossible to travel through. So to expand the other side of the wormhole, and this is gonna sound so redneck but I swear it's science, we would basically need to shove a pole of antimatter into the wormhole to wedge the other side open. Antimatter will repel the edges of the wormhole and prevent it from closing. And with any hope, it will open up the other side of the space-time tear enough to travel through. Then we just send through the parts to put together another time machine, and now that time and place is available for any time machine to travel to. And that is the time machine I would make if I had complete freedom to design it. And I think at this point I can't really call it my time machine. I'll be honest, going into this project, I was hoping I'd be able to design a personal time machine. But I guess making time travel possible is going to take a lot of cooperation. Different people in different times and places are going to need to work together to make something that was once thought as impossible, possible. It's kind of poetic when you think about it. And with that, I hope you enjoyed listening to me talk about time travel, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Goodbye!